Okay. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Activities for People Living with Dementia. We're proud to offer this series with funding from the Area Agency on Aging and the United Way of Tarrant County. Some of our programs are recorded and some are made available for viewing through our YouTube channel for future use. If you haven't checked it out, go to DementiaFriendlyFortWorth.org, choose the Longhorn logo on a blue background and check the word videos. We have things back three years from when we first got started. I'm Martha Brown, your host for today's activities. It's always my pleasure to have Peggy back in the flesh on the Zoom. She's bringing us artful moments from the Eamon Carter, and her topic today is numbers. I can't wait to see what numbers means in the art world. Peggy, it's all yours. Thank you, Martha. Yes, ma'am. Well, I'm bummed to not see um, uh, Myra and Don here because he's a numbers mind himself, but yes. we'll just have to watch the recording. Yes. See, I think hopefully I'm speaking to your brain today a little bit as well. And Janine loves numbers too, and she's listening, but she's not participating right now. Oh, okay. Well, welcome. Yeah. So I don't, I couldn't find a lot on the artworks we're going to look at today, but there are a lot of artworks that include numbers, whether it's the actual number itself or a fascination with a type of number, whatever uh, it is, numbers do play a lot. Um, in the art. In some instances, they are used for a study. So here, we've got an artist who is using these, he was very interested in color theory and how colors played off of each other. And so he's using a grid, which is not numbers, but it's math, um, and breaking down using different symbols you can see in here, and some of them have little marks in them using numbers and symbols from different cultures, Mayan culture, uh, Chinese culture, to create these studies that in and of themselves are beautiful artwork. And so you can see over here, we've got a little cheat sheet. I remember making those when we were learning multiplication tables. Do you remember doing that? Those like columns mm -hmm. of it? <laughs> yes, I remember the the, uh, on the board. She had it written on the board the whole semester. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and I only, we only learned up to 12, like, you know, eight times 12, but my brain never got past 11. Like I just couldn't, that's why I work in the arts these days, but I just, you know, this is a very beautiful way of here, here we're seeing what these grids are breaking down to. And it's, it's pretty cool to see an artwork that's rooted in math. And I don't know anything about the Pag Pag I can't even say it. Pythagorean. Thank you. Theory or any of that. Did Steve, are you pretty versed in that? No. That's my wife's yeah, that's my wife's area of mathematics. That's not mine. Yeah, I'm not my dad's brain works that way. My brain does not. And so um I, I always think it's really fascinating when you see how uh, someone makes sense of something that's a kind of complicated theory. So here he's kind of, he's working on some color theories and he um, didn't quite fall in a category of art because it's not quite pop, but it's not abstract. So he just kind of made a name for himself um, as an intellect who was using these symbols that depict different belief systems and math systems uh, to create these color theories and patterns. So here's one, and he started, so he, by the time 1965 rolled around, he'd been doing this since like the mid to late 50s. So he'd gotten kind of a reputation for it at this point. That came to him later in his career, this, what he's known for. So here's another one as well. And you can see some symbols it is interesting that he wrote on the art. Mm -hmm. That is part of the art, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not like someone went back and marked it up. This was all included in his, his grids. So this one was a tamarind print. We've talked about this. 
this tamarind before where they um, artists are invited to, to work in a medium that's different than what they're used to working in. And so he was uh, working in lithograph off and on in his life, but he was invited to this workshop. And so this particular one is one of a, of, uh, a larger series of 20. So there he was kind of working with other grids and things. They felt similar as if they were all part of the same portfolio, which is common when we've looked at artists and uh, pieces from Tamarind. This was not Tamarind. This was, I believe, before um, the Tamarind invite. And so here it's, again, he's working through these same type of colors and numbers and gridding. So it feels pretty organized within it, but we're not exactly sure what all of these notes, this one doesn't have a key or anything for us to kind of reference. Looks like a Rubik's cube. That's kind of wild. Yeah, it reminded me of, um, I don't know if you have ever seen these. They're, it's kind of like weaving, but we, as a child, it was like a, the kids weaving, there were like these rubber bands and yeah. it was a grid and there were the hooks all the way around and you would mm -hmm. that's what yeah. kind of it looked like you'd make a lot of pot holders that pot was like holders. The, yeah it was pot like holders. the only thing you could make yes <laughs> and so you but you had all these really fun and kind of crazy and kooky colors like all blending together um and so I feel like that's kind of reminiscent of what of what we did as children but here he is as a grown adult really working through how these colors are playing off of each other and things like that so you can see some of these have three that has an R he's also in other artwork using symbols that are from pre-Columbian and Maya calendars and things like that so he's playing with different ideas of what theories are or what a continuum is or whatever you said you didn't have a lot of background but I'm going to ask is there anything that you know of that's significant about the lime and black? Mm -mm. Okay. Just interested in colors. He was very interested in colors, colors and patterning. So oh. um, a lot of his colors are really fun. Like you can see here, kind of that purpley and the red. And so uh, all of his artworks are very colorful, but not necessarily tracing meaning to any of the particular color that I've been able to find. It's more so just the theory of color and the theory of pattern. Gotcha. All right. So we're going to leave our, our friend Alfred Jensen behind for a, a pop artist named Robert Indiana. He changed his name. It used to be Robert Clark, but then he named himself Robert Indiana after the state he grew up in. What do we see here? A backward two. Mm -hmm. A backward four. Yeah, four. We got one. Those are even two. numbers. And yeah, we've got all numbers. four corners numbered. Ah. It, it's two. like you have the one, and as it goes around the circle, it's flipping the two. Goes around the circle, it's flipping the three. Mm -hmm. It goes around the circle, it's flipping the four. Correct. Yeah, it feels at first glance kind of discombobulated, but again, we're noticing a patterning to it that makes it feel a little more structured. We've got the green in each corner, so your eyes kind of pull to the so outside, but then are kept, it feels even. You know, the arrow directly mm -hmm. across from that is the red, so again, we've got the balance. We're keeping it a pretty... A pretty simple color palette, but probably a very familiar one. This was done in 1964. So um, this is, he's considered a pop artist. And you might know his, the most famous work he has is the L-O-V-E that he stacked on top of each other. There's the one in Philadelphia that's really famous, the sculpture. That's the same artist. So he was well known in the pop art scene and he was using colors and symbols that were common to a consumer in advertising. So um, there's this stencil. It looks like he's using stencils. So it has that kind of pre-manufactured, not, not much of the artist's hand involved when you're using a stencil. Um, 
And he he's using arrows, which are very familiar if you're going to a fast food restaurant or if you're, you know, just reading roadway signs. These are all things that were part of a, a you know, emojis of that time that we're, we're used to reading. Mm -hmm. um, he considered himself a, uh, what's it called? A sign painter. So he he knew he he was really good at painting, especially in a in a mode that was recognizable by the everyday person. You didn't have to understand art to understand a sign type of thing. So that was where he that's what he considered himself to be. And this, although it's uh, labeled untitled, it's uh, part of a or the the sub name is called Four Winds. So you've got, you know, your four. To me, I thought when I first looked at this before I did any research on it, I thought it was like one of those dancing instruction sheets. Uh-huh. With it, the it like read to me as like left foot right, right foot left, you know, you doing your moves. But um no, it's the four winds. And there's a quote from a poem at the top. Take uh take good care of self-long journey ahead, keep strength good, ideas, love in I can't quite read that word. Um, something very in deep earth spirit itself, like want to four winds, grant to four winds. I can't perfectly read all of it, but you did better than I would have. I don't know. <laughs> but this artwork and this artwork were in a larger portfolio called One Cent Light. So um, while this artist wasn't technically considered a pop artist, the colors that you spoke to, Martha, were of, you know, a color palette that was typically associated with pop artists. And so here, while they're very different, they have some, some vestiges of, of similarity. Yeah. Uh, Peggy, yeah. I, I find it interesting that there is the green one and just one green arrow. So you would expect that there would just be two black arrows and three red and four yellow. You're right. They're four of everything except for the green. No, you're exactly right. It's it's just an extra arrow he threw in even. It's not even, there's all three and then that fourth one. So yeah, it's a, it's a artistic inclusion. You know, he's really, he's, I don't know if he's making a, a statement by it, but it's knowing it feels balanced and it feels balanced in color, but then there's a little bit of a, this or an imbalance because there's a fourth arrow but it doesn't mm. throw off the flow of the so it's he he was very nuanced with this inclusion good observation yada yes all right we got another one from this guy robert indiana this was um this was not part of this portfolio that we just saw this was something different and so knowing what we know he was using symbols that people would recognize. What kind of symbol in here do you recognize? The number. Yeah, a big number. And the hexagon. The hexagon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It so, looks a little bit like a button. Oh, like a clothing button? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Steve? It, oh, go ahead. Steve, were you gonna say something? No. Okay. It's got, again, that stenciling. So something you might see on the side of a gas station. His mom was, worked in a diner and his dad worked as a gas truck driver for a company. So he's kind of referencing to some of those things you might see roadside. Hexagon isn't a sign for anything, you know, that we would recognize now, but we're, you're, we're used to seeing certain shapes uh, denoting certain things with roadways so this is you know something you might kind of recognize or be familiar with this type of signage again on a road numbers on it painted on a building numbers I mean mm -hmm. he's painting again in a style that feels very um recognizable to mm -hmm. people who are just living their everyday lives but then there's that, you know eternal like hexagon funny. hexagon it's just funny he's naming sometimes pop artists will put the name of not what you're seeing so this he's he's reinforcing our thought of what we're seeing hexagon and the hexagon it looks like a company logo 
it has it does it feels very reminiscent of that it looks like super a uh, super motel six or whatever it's called yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly You're, mm -hmm. i mean that's exactly right he's he's playing off consumerism things we would recognize but putting it in a situation where we're like wait a minute I thought that was an advertisement for Motel 6, but it's not saying anything of substance to it. <laughs> it makes me think about the uh, places where you would go in case of a uh, apocalypse that have the triangle and the triangle within the triangle. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, the color palette. Radio. Radio the color palette feels a little more serious than this. This feels kind of playful. Um, I think the brown and the black really kind of tamp down any sort of playfulness in that it it speaks more to a, a, a serious tenor that you're kind of referencing, Martha. Yes, it's trying to guide you somewhere or tell you something specific. I mean, now why is it called? Why, why does he call it? I mean, I know it's untitled, but why is it Eternal Hexagon? Eternal means that it goes on forever and ever, right? Yeah, I don't, I couldn't find anything to explain the language of it. I mean, is it, it's six sides, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, yeah. so the six, I think it's kind of funny that he's just really um, elevating that number six with the hexagon and beating it over your head. I mean, we're, we're, we got it. We see the shape. You're, re, you're saying the number six. You're saying the hexagon twice, hexagon twice, but I don't know what the eternal... Well, it, it's it's within a circle. The circle is complete, it means completeness. Right. Oh, so you're, he's referencing eternal, is referencing the circle, you feel? Yeah, so the hexagon is a hexagon, but it's in the complete circle. So it's eternally in yeah. that circle. Right, which it's we're not even acknowledging the other shape, the circle. You're right. There are two circles there. We've got the black circle and the yellow circle, and then the little dots on the side. So I mean, there are plenty of other shapes, but we are are focusing on the hexagon. Those pop artists. Those pop artists. They're, they're so tricky. <laughs> All right. Well, we're we've got one more, and it's totally different than what you'd think of with number oh this is a terrible reproduction i apologize <laughs> so we talk about numbers in the art world and within a museum world particularly we have catalog numbers and i have i ever talked about catalog numbers or not, I to, many, not to me okay so a catalog number or an accession number is are the museum's database has a way of listing and organizing artworks that come into their collection. And so typically museums do it generally the same, but there's different museums that have a little bit of a devi deviation from it, but it, all that information will be there. So for example, we're looking at this catalog number right here, 1950.76. So we know that this artwork was acquired in 1950 and it was the 76th piece that year that entered the collection. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Some of them might have, like, after this, it might say dot A. And so that might mean this is part A of B. This might be part of two pieces in an artwork. Or it might say 76.1. And this is then a much larger series of, let's say, like a portfolio where each artwork is considered one piece versus each artwork within the portfolio considered a different piece. It depends on on the artwork, on the curator, on how it was gifted, the whole bit. So the catalog number is really very valuable when you're researching um, an artwork, when you're trying to track down the location of an artwork. A lot of times we'll just use the accession number versus the title of the artwork. Because for example, how many untitled do we have in this? How many untitled do we have in this slideshow alone? One, two, two. three. Four. four. Okay. So when you're using an accession number, it gets you right to the artwork you need to get to versus showing you 15,000 untitled and you try to sift through to get what you need. Mm -hmm. So numbers mean a lot in the, in the art history or in the art museum world. With that history, so now this artist, Wendy Redstar, she is a member of the, I want to, I want to make sure I'm saying it right, Apsuloka 
which is a, a Crow mm -hmm. uh, nation. She's a photographer. And in, um, in 2016 and 2017, she had a residency with the Denver Art Museum. And she was, it, I, when I worked at the Denver Art Museum, I worked with the Native, with the Native Arts Department in education. It was really cool. There are objects within that collection that um, have, or were some of the first pieces in their Denver's collection. There are artworks that can only be viewed by certain people at certain times. It was very, very cool to, um, to learn how objects that were not, that were of, of different nations, how they were treated because early on the Denver Art Museum was trying to treat the objects with respect the way that they were intended to be used. So, all that to say, she got to spend a lot of time with the Native Arts Department and got to look through the catalog of pieces in the collection. This was pre-databases, this was pre-photographs. She came across a collection of 40-something um, objects from the Native Arts Department that were hand-drawn and painted as part of their database. So, um, they, you know, basically it was like a card catalog filing system before computers ever came around. So this art, this picture or this drawing you can tell in the background is of a elk tooth dress that was in the Denver Arts Collection. This is one from their collection. This is not the same one, but this is what this object looks like at, in a photograph. Okay. It's a similar object looks in the photograph. So she took pictures of this wrap of this catalog card and then went back to her crow nation and was present for a, an annual parade and was able to informally take pictures of of crow uh people in the crow nation wearing or using objects that she found when she was in the denver art museum's collection so it was a really cool merging and then she digitally merged the two together. So you're seeing a, a crow woman wearing an elf, elf tooth shirt in front of then the catalog picture that was drawn, you know, a hundred years ago, so to speak. So it was a really cool merging of a very live culture and tradition that goes back so long ago, and we're able to see how not much has changed in terms of that type of uh, fashion or tradition or regalia wearing. And what's really cool is, and, and maybe y'all know this, I remember learning this when I was at the Denver Art Museum, thought it was one of, one of the coolest facts. Elk have two ivory teeth in their head. And oh. so it that's a lot of teeth. That's a lot of elk. That's a lot of elk, yeah. Yeah, and so these shirts, um, depending on which High Plains nation you're talking about, both men and women can wear them, depending. Um, that's a status symbol, that they were able, they have something to showcase this many ivory teeth. And so the more teeth, the higher status and wealth you typically had. Mm. So pretty darn cool. That's significant. But yeah, so her catalog number, she doesn't, you know, identify anyone or what the particular object is. It, you know that the object of the background is we should be looking for it on the person in the front. And there's a number of these in the series, whether it's um, a fan or a saddlebag or a saddle blanket or a bridal. There's a number of, of artwork. She took pictures of the catalog card and then found it being used in um in, in their tradition. Beautiful. So those are our numbers. This last one was kind of a reach for numbers, but numbers in a way that makes sense to museum people. <laughs> and we learned a lot. And you learned a little. I hope so. Good. Yeah. Um, next week, we are back with landscape. Landscape, abstract, and flowers are ones we could never, ever retire or get rid of because we have <laughs> just so many. So we'll look That's at That's true. Looking forward to it, Peggy. Thank you, Peggy. Yeah. And as right, you, you came in week, hot. I'll see y'all next week. Thank you, oh, you too, Peggy. Thank you, Peggy. We Bye. appreciate you.